Hello, folks. I'm Jamie Young. Welcome to the Terran Files. And today I have Lonnie Kuntz, who is running to primary Congresswoman Lee Stefanik for the 21st Congressional Dix District here in New York. Uh, he is a Republican, a retired combat veteran who has seen several deployments to both Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, like to first start off with some of that uh, background so where people would know what you did while in the uh, army. Well, uh, for starters, I grew up in farm country of uh, South Central Michigan, milking cows, mowing grass. Uh, so the farming community is just something I, I grew up around. Uh, I went to college and uh, met my, my wife and we uh, found out we were having a baby, so I joined the Army. Uh, I kind of just told them to get me out of there as fast as I could and get me the biggest bonus possible because I had a baby on the way. And uh, mm -hmm. they, made, they made me an infantryman. So uh, that's what I did for 20 years and 11 days is, uh, you know, shot guns and yelled at people and took my soldiers on patrol. Um, just like uh, you said, I, I had been both to Iraq and Afghanistan uh, mm -hmm. as well as Korea um, and stationed a whole bunch of places, mainly in the south, uh, but then moved up north. And uh, upon retirement, uh, my wife uh, and I sat down and looked at things and I let her choose where she wanted to go. And we picked uh, the woods of the Anirondacks up here. And this is where we're gonna stay until the day we die, so. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I understand that kind of lifestyle. I grew up in the Air Force. Lots of moving. When, well, from what I can remember, not that much moving. Um, <laughs> but then again, the period see i'm 12 years older than you are i was i grew up in the 60s and the 70s ah yes okay vietnam cold war yep and, and um but the only two bases that i remember my family being stationed at was whiteman and the former plattsburgh air force base oh, yep so more in common with your kids than I do with those that serve. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But um, on your, um, during your time in the uh, service, you learned a lot in the way of um, management skills um, and also especially leadership skills. Mm -hmm. uh, can we talk a little bit about that? Well, management wise, uh, as a young infantryman, uh, when we had our first baby, they, uh, once we, uh, had the baby, they moved me directly into an office. And I will say that I spent probably well over half my career in offices working as physicians that were way out of my skill set at the time. And, mm -hmm. uh, definitely worked above my rank, uh, as an E2 was working as a training NCO, which, uh, basically I had about a hundred men. Uh, that were in the company that my job was to handle everything administrative and pay and legal for those soldiers, uh, tracking every piece of data that you could think of. And then probably some, um, as I progressed, uh, you know, I did that job a couple times. I ended up working on battalion and brigade staffs, um, learning all kinds of different, uh, uh, skills as far as for the, the administrative and management piece. Uh, and I ended my career, uh, working as a brigade and division, uh, what they call DTMS, the digital training management system uh, uh, instructor. I was the only one west of the Mississippi. So I had people from everywhere for my last six months in the army come to me and I was teaching them uh, that system because the army was making them start to use it finally after eight years. Um, as far as for leadership, you know, I, I did deploy uh, and uh, did a lot of foot patrols with my men. Uh, again, being infantrymen, you know, our job was to go door to door uh, looking for bad guys, help the, the locals, things like that. And, uh, you know, my job was to ensure that my soldiers were one, safe, two, that the mission was accomplished, and three, that their families were taken care of. And uh, that's the type of leadership and firsthand, one-on-one -on -one, uh, work I want to bring to North Country. Treat this just like I did my soldiers in the aspect of everyone in North Country would be one of my soldiers and my job mm -hmm. is to ensure that they are taken care of in the best way that i can possibly provide so i still to this day i've been out for four and a half years i get phone calls from soldiers uh seniors uh asking me questions that you know you would think that they know and i wouldn't know but 
you know, I, I learned a lot and worked well above my pay grade. So. You know, sometimes we all have to do that. Um, I know that from stepping into the role of being on a board of directors for a LGBTQ organization that's based in uh, Saranac Lake. Okay. So, and prior to that, never had a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Got to learn someplace. True, true. But um, your last assignment was at uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord in Washington. Yep. And then you decided to move out here. Yep. Um, besides that whole thing of your wife deciding where you guys were going to retire to, was there any exact reason? Because sometimes when people retire from the air, well, retire from the service, they typically choose to go back to where they originally grew up. Yep. Well, back home in Michigan, unfortunately, the job market's really bad. Taxes mm -hmm. really bad. And the state government in Michigan is uh, worse than it is here in New York. Um, so the main reason we chose here over any other place was we had two things we were looking for. We wanted to be within 30 miles of a military base, which mm -hmm. is Fort Drum. And we wanted someplace that has four seasons. So that pretty much put us here or Fort Carson, Colorado. And we liked it here better just because it was more woodsy, more, less, less population. Mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're not big on huge crowds of people. We, we like, like I said, I live out in the middle of the woods and, you know, nobody shows up at my house asking me to buy Girl Scout cookies even. So we, we enjoy that kind of quiet. Oh yeah. Yeah. True. True. Um, yeah. My, when my uh, family retired, well, when my family left the service, my first, my father and my first stepfather were both Air Force, but uh, we moved over to Vermont, Essex Junction. Oh, yep, been there. And um, right outside Burlington. Yeah, yeah. Part Third of the family uh, dollar there. <laughs> one of the uh, part of the overall greater Burlington area. Yep. Largest city in Vermont. Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, been there. Yeah, but. Um, Going through some of the stuff that um, you have, um, let's see here. And um, this is all, you can say, interconnected. Yes. And it has to do with, um, oh, shoot, playing with my phone at the same time. Happens. Yeah. <laughs> Um, gun control, diversity with the LGBT and news, social media, mass, well, mass media, social, yeah, along with um, racial diversity, hate groups. Um, one of the, and I'm going uh, to do this scene that I am playing on my phone also. Um, let me just bring this up. Oh, come on. There we go. <laughs> but um, those, oh, Jesus. Scan to the next screen or two. Yeah. But you, um, you can see right there new, news, mass media, social media. These are all interconnected. Yes. Um, now, if I can only get out of this. <laughs> But um, oh damn, this is gonna be a one messed up. <laughs> it's okay. I like being a guinea pig. Yeah, yeah. But um, there we go. There we are. Yeah, there's a few other things that um, 
but um, this is, you're going to have to bring this back up again. Sorry. <laughs> but um, right here, and I copied this. These are the, what, is known as our Bill of Rights, going from the First Amendment down to the 10th Amendment. But I wanna just focus on the First and the Second Amendment, yep. which does cover those topics right there. Does. Um, one of the um, things that I, and this is a little bit of history, family history for me, is that um, one of the founding fathers, a guy by the name of James Wilson, he helped, he had a hand in writing this stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, this First Amendment is pretty good when you come right down to it. But the Second Amendment, that tends to be very vague mm -hmm. in the respect that, um, as you can see, it says, a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right for right of people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed upon. During the Revolutionary War, which was um, very much a hard fought war. That was something that when the founding fathers were actually sitting down and writing the constitution, they had their own concerns about the overreach of government, the use of the military against the people, because at the time, the Royal Crown, they, you can say, allowed their troops, the British troops to occupy private residence. Yes. And within the Constitution, within the Bill of Rights, it said that no military personnel would be sheltered in private houses. Correct. But also the whole thing of the um, right to bear arms during that period of time too, a lot of those colonists, the colonials themselves were hunters. Yes. And, and this is from what I can gather is that um, when they were writing it, that little thing saying that the right to bear arms should not be infringed upon, that has been taken, you can say, or interpreted badly in yes. the respect that people nowadays see the right of the bear arms as you can have any kind of weapon whatsoever. Anywhere from a simple 22 hunting rifle to assault style weapons, similar to what you carried when you were on deployment. Mm -hmm. And being somebody that served in those type of areas, you are very familiar with the capabilities of those. Yes. And um, New York, along with Massachusetts and California, are three of the states that have the strictest gun laws. And right now, there is, and it has been a growing thing over decades of this whole idea that we have to protect ourselves from overreach of the government. 
Yes. Which has spurred what most people call militia groups, which under every single state constitution and even the federal constitution, it does not mention those type of groups. What it mentions is a well-maintained militia, i.e. what we call the National Guard. Any thoughts on that? Because according to what I have found, they are paramilitary groups which are illegal under federal statutes and state statutes. There's a lot of things that come into play with that. So first thing is it states that a well-regulated militia, which mm -hmm. is authorized according to the constitution. Um, now, whether it's, so for instance, I grew up in Michigan, they have the Michigan militia, which is an authorized militia within the state and recognized federally. Again, they're a regulated militia. Now, when you start getting into some of these things, we'll just, uh, what were the ones, the, the Proud Boys uh, right. or the Boogaloo Boys or any of those, those are not regulated. That is the difference. Mm -hmm. Now, the, yeah. there was a Supreme Court hearing, uh, Columbia versus, I'd have to look it up. I have it on my website, I'm sorry. But the Supreme Court ruled that well-regulated militia did not, involve or did not speak to the individual person mm. only the group so an individual me by myself and not a regulated militia mm -hmm. so again these things kind of conflict each other and it depends on what you're doing once you join a group that is not well regulated that is the part that becomes partially or quasi illegal depending on what they're doing if you were a member of a recognized militia not the national guard because they are separate a militia, right. i.e. the Michigan militia or something like that, that is mm -hmm. authorized because, again, it's regulated. Now, where we come into the problem is, again, these groups, when people arm themselves and they are not well regulated and they are in a group that has the point or the power to start to create disturbances, that is the illegal part. Um, it goes back down to we'll just use Black Lives Matter. It's the same thing. Moving back into the First Amendment. Yes, we all have the right to peacefully protest. At the point mm -hmm. where bricks start going through windows or people start brandishing guns, now all of a sudden, this is a violation of your First Amendment rights and it's no longer authorized. It, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, I, I, out of these things. It, 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 there's, there's this big gray area because during last year's Black Lives Matter protests, all the reporting that came out was that for the most part, say 95% of that, they were peaceful protesters exercising their First Amendment rights. Yes. When you have outside agitators come in, that's yes. when the mayhem starts. Correct. And it happens at every, almost every event that's protesting something, that's exactly what happens. You'll have 90, 95% all peaceful and then all of a sudden it goes to hell in a handbasket because a small group of people there to instigate creates the problem mm -hmm. and then it gives the whole it gives the whole uh debate that was going on that day or that that uh, protest a bad name because of the actions of a few it's the same way if you were talking about the police most police are not bad a couple oh, yeah. do something stupid and now all police are bad it, it's it's they're, they're grouping everything together and and that's unfair yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I know, um, as a matter of fact, I'm good friends with one of our uh, city police officers. And um, we both acknowledge that there are those that shouldn't be on the police force because of their yeah. past conduct. And that's where police reform needs to happen. Yep. Is to weed out those individuals but the other issue being within that overall reforming of law enforcement you need to treat them as professionals meaning they need the type of training because over in europe to become a police officer 
you go through years of training. Correct. While here in the States, it's a few months and that's it. Six to 12 weeks, depending. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, that is where we have, you can say, faltered. I agree. And the history of policing in the U.S. goes back to the days of slavery. Well, there were police before that. Yeah, but, yeah, yes. yeah. But as far as the actual, you can say, mainly the policing in the southern states. <laughs> okay, yes, a lot of it, yes. So that's where that whole reforming of that needs to be seriously looked at. And well, again, I, if, if you go on my website, one of the things I do specifically talk about is police, uh, judicial, and prison reform as a three-pronged attack. Because again, you're right, our police officers, while they're doing the best they can with what they're given, they are ill-equipped, ill-trained, and they're kind of thrown to the wolves. And you know, we almost do this to them without giving them the proper training to be able to handle some of these things. Like, and then the proper care, because there's a lot of mental burden that goes with that. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we, we, we really set our police up for failure. Again, you're right. A lot of foreign countries, they do. Their, their, their programs are a lot longer, and they're not officers on the beat for years. Whereas, like I said, us within a few months of deciding to be a police officer and then finally getting through the courses, you're on the streets. And there's a lot to deal with that you just can't learn in that amount of time. And then as right. far as the judicial system, again, I speak about the fact that, you know, judges rule differently area to area. So mm -hmm. if a person in Wyoming commits the exact same crime I commit here in New York, our punishments most likely will not be equal. Not even taking into the fact race, age, priors, anything. We're just talking about the fact of just being in different demographic areas. And that's one of the things I think we need to look at is having equal punishments for equal crimes. Right. Um, and then when it comes down to the prison reform thing, we put people in prison for the idea to reform them to rejoin society. The problem is we there put is them none. there. Right. We put them there and all we have done is spiraled them out of control because now when we do put them back into the general population, they are looked upon as lesser because of what they may or may not have done, whatever it is. And mm -hmm. they can't even get a job flipping burgers. Right. So they revert back to crime, generally spiraling worse and worse and worse. They go back to prison. They get out. They get out. They come back. They do it. Just it, it repeats itself. We're not solving a problem. We're putting a bandaid on a bullet hole. We have to actually try to figure out the source of what caused this person to commit these crimes and then what we can do to fix it. Mm -hmm. At least remedy the, the situation so that they don't go back to that because by us just throwing them in prison and then throwing them back out and saying hey you can't even get a job above flipping burgers because you're a criminal or a prior criminal what do you expect these people to do they got to keep the lights on they got to pay their bills they got to feed their families they're going to revert back it's and very and very few that have been in that experience of being incarcerated they are able to get their you can say act together and become better than what they were. But mm -hmm. majority of them, they fall right back into the same routines. Um, I know that from the experience that my uh, great nephew has had with uh, being incarcerated. Right. But um, Dina, I've got, I've got a, a, a half brother that has spent the majority of his adult life behind bars. And unfortunately he has nothing to turn to because Again, he's basically unhirable. Mm -hmm. What do you expect this guy to do to take care of his family? I'm not just talking about my brother. I'm talking about in general. Right. So. Yeah. And the same thing with my uh, nephew, who unfortunately passed away earlier this year. Now, that being said, I'm not saying these people didn't commit the crime. It, no. It's not a matter of whether they did or didn't commit the crime. It's whether we can rehabilitate or you know, reassociate these people into regular society. And the prison system currently doesn't do that. All it does is puts them in the system so that they spiral into the system repeatedly most of the time. I think it's 60 to 70% of criminals end up back in prison. Mm -hmm. And then of those 60 to 70%, 70 to 80% will be back in prison again. So all we're doing is making it worse. Yeah. And um, one of the, and there's a big, 
discrepancy between our prison systems and some of those in Europe. Uh, Switzerland is a good example because they actually rehabilitate those that are incarcerated. And once they get out, they're given a, a clean slate. You can say- I won't go as far as a clean slate, but I, I will say that there should be parts of their record that are maybe withheld from employers. I mean, obviously if they committed a violent crime, that's different, but if they, if they committed a crime, as long as it's not like murder or something like that, then why shouldn't they have the opportunity to get back into the workforce if they've been rehab rehabilitated? You right. look at this and maybe part of the problem is the privatized uh, prison I, system. I, I was gonna- Because now we, they're making money off of these people. I'm just saying, we're, you know. Yeah, well, I was gonna lead into that because- <laughs> Sorry, I beat you to it. <laughs> that's fine. But um, yeah, the privatized prison system that's something that really either needs to be gotten rid of or needs to have some serious regulations and yeah. restraints put down onto them where they have to provide certain services to help those that have been incarcerated. Yes. Um, I'm going to use my um, nephew as an example. Um, from the time he was in his teens to a few years back, he was constantly being reincarcerated. Yep. Typically, it was either for drugs or for break, breaking and entering. He never did anything violent that I'm aware of. But during that, his time being incarcerated, there were very few programs you can say that were involved that he was involved in and that is something that should be really taken a look at because some of these things that inmates get involved in doing to help rehabilitate themselves they really don't last that long and it, that has to do with again, budget it's, cuts. It's patching, it's patching a problem instead of fixing the problem. We right. need to get back, we need to get to the point where we're actually allowing rehabilitatable prisoners to transition back into the population. That's what they're not getting right now. They're getting they're getting makeshift care that kind of sort of makes them, you know, at least answer the question to make them seem or appear to be, you know, ready to go, but then they get back out and we haven't done anything other than you know, giving them counseling, but they can't do anything because we've just set them up. There's no transition. It's, it's you go from inmate to here you go, go get a job, which by the way, you can't get a job. Yeah, as soon, because um, as soon as they get out, because they've been so conditioned to one thing. And this is, you can kind of say, it, you can see the relationship within the military itself. Yes. Because those that, have served in uniform, they tend to have a harder time. They do. Um, but um, something else I want to fix. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. There's a um, lot of transitioning for soldiers, not to jump subjects, but there, there's a lot of, again, it's almost the same thing as a prison system. We have a whole lengthy process of transitioning out. But again, it literally is a Band-Aid because it doesn't truly do anything to help. I, I've been asked by many over the last four years what I've done differently because I'm successful. There's a lot of veterans or people who transition out of the military that don't succeed. And again, the military does not do that great of a job through their transition process to actually transition soldiers to civilians. And that's the exact same problem we have with the prison system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Looks good on paper. And it checks the block, but it doesn't do anything. Yeah. And that's something that uh, those that are in Congress that are on the Armed Services Committee, our Congresswoman being one of them, have not directly identified or acknowledged. Well, part of that comes down to the fact of <laughs> how can you lead something that you haven't done? I, I, and again, that's not a knock on Ms. Stefanik, but 
she never served. Yes, she supports the military, but she, she didn't do the job. I mean, for 20 years and 11 days, I did it. it mm -hmm. You know, I can speak intelligently on what these processes are and how it can actually be changed to benefit these, these soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, guardians, whatever, mm -hmm. into civilian life. And again, I've never been a prisoner, luckily, but we have the same discussion with moving prisoners to the civilian population again. Mm -hmm. We have people that are on these committees who have never done it, done any of these jobs. You could go to the Federal Trade Commission with the uh, highway uh, interstate commerce the same way I've looked at it. There's very few people on that committee who have ever worked in the interstate commerce. You have the postmaster general who's never worked in a post office before. No, he, he's, <laughs> he, 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 he is an owner of a private transport yeah. company how can you properly lead something or make decisions for something that you have not done mm -hmm. i'm not talking these and these committees are the committees that directly influence policy and the president himself or herself someday mm -hmm. but how can they give the proper advice if they don't have that experience if you are on the armed forces committee maybe you should have some sort of armed forces background if you're on the interstate uh, commerce committee maybe you should have some sort of background in that. or, or at or, least ha or at least have somebody within your group that has had that experience that can speak to that yes and as far as i'm aware of most politicians don't have that there's only just a handful of elected officials in washington that have had that experience. Well, we look at the same thing with politicians, the way I, I talk about politicians. How many politicians out there have ever had to determine what bill they were gonna pay to keep food on the table, to keep the lights on? Mm -hmm. You know, The majority, and I'm not saying all of them, the majority have never had to do that, but yet they will sit there in front of the TV screen telling us that they feel what we feel and they understand our plight. How? Mm -hmm. I'm not the smartest guy on the planet, I'm not. But if you've never experienced it, never witnessed it firsthand, kind of hard for you to say you know what I'm feeling because you don't. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's, you know, it's just like um, when they have these uh, discussions. Um, well, the best example that I can think of was um, when The previous administration, previous president, took money that was already allocated for projects, military projects. One of them was um, a new school at uh, oh Fort Campbell because the old one was no good. They had. Literally, they have to tear the whole building down, and put up a new one. That school, fund, or are we talking about a military, uh, uh, like a uh, education school for the children, or are we talking yes, about? Yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay. And as an example, seeing that I was, I grew up in schools that were on military bases. Right. The Dodds, the Dodds system. Yes. Yeah, and um, when that money was taken away to put towards something that everybody acknowledges is a waste of money that's that border wall at the southern border yeah there i personally i was not happy about that because it was taking money away from service members children who need the education and my understanding is that at Fort Campbell, they had multiple classes going on in the same classrooms, which is very distracting for the students. I imagine it would be. So that was something that I wasn't in, not to uh, knock Stefanik, but she thought it was no big deal. I would like to know where the money came from to pay for the wall. That would be something. I mean, if I could see the nickels and dimes, I'm not saying I can or can't agree with what you're saying about this. Right. I'm just saying that I don't personally know where that funding came from and what it took away. Uh, I do know this from being in the military that the military spending, while people will argue that the military budget has grown out of control, I will say 
I don't know if it's grown out of control as much as there's no accountability for where the funding goes. Example, during you know the Iraq campaign, you know, we have pallets of money missing. Mm -hmm. Poof, gone. I mean, that's that's one example, very small. That's us. We I just think that before it's almost like the defund the police movement. They, they almost say defund the military. And I think that what we need to look at before we say defund is let's look at where every dime is going first. Right. And I think as taxpayers, we have the right to know where of every course. dime is going because it's our money. Of course. But of yes, course. now speaking about border walls, I don't know if a border wall is the best answer. All I can say to that is that every sovereign nation in this world has borders and does not mm -hmm. freely let anyone in. So somehow the northern and southern borders of our country need to be policed, whether that's by checkpoints, whether that's by roving patrols, whether it's by UAVs, helicopters, planes, or whether it's by a physical barrier, something has to be there. Uh, again, the nuts and bolts of that, again, I, I can't physically see it, but again, I've been other places in the world, you know, we, we want to give money to all these other countries to build walls, but yet when we build our own people get angry it's like now wait a second we just gave whatever country this was billions of dollars to build a wall but when we take billions of dollars and build our own wall now it's a problem and the mm -hmm. people really the people really complain about this what really bugs me is they live within walled compounds so they have their <laughs> yeah you know they're, they're talking about this from behind their walled compound that we don't need walls while they're behind walls again this is the contradiction and the the, the problem we have with our current politicians is that they live in this world that it's, it's like, how do I say this politely? Their poo doesn't stink. Mm -hmm. I can't argue with that. Um, <laughs> but, um, oh, when it comes to, um, And this is something that's off topic too. Um, Happens. <laughs> yes, it does, especially with me. Uh, oh, good. <laughs> um, on the whole border thing, um, our immigration system was broken at the get go. Yes. Because, and I thought about this because people have always complained about the whole immigration i'm not saying we should get rid of the whole immigration thing but we never had a problem with immigration until immigration laws came into effect and that was our immigration laws came into effect around the same time all these other countries europe in particular were putting in place immigration laws and even those immigration laws that they have are broken too. Anything made by man is broken. It's it's infallible. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Yeah, that's why. Um, it's fallible. I, that, that's why I mentioned to people that even though the Constitution is a beautiful document, mm -hmm. well written, it's fallible. It's it's the best solution we had at the time for what it was. Does it need to be maybe looked at and revamped a little bit? Maybe, but also I believe that the founding fathers deliberately left it kind of open and vague because the future was so uncertain. You mm -hmm. know, I, I'm sure that they never envisioned cities the size of Los Angeles and New York, uh, Chicago. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, same and thing with guns. I don't think that they ever envisioned the the ability to, to you know have a man carried nuclear weapon or even envision a nuclear weapon uh you know it was left as a very broad document so that it didn't constrict but at the same point in time some of this is just common sense and uh, again com the problem with common sense is it's not common i no. mean what you and i think to be the right answer morally correct someone else says hey no you know what we'll just use guns for instance you know what i deserve to have a nuke because my government has a nuke mm -hmm. Uh, now, again, I don't know if you saw Newsweek kind of 
gaffed on me on that because they they took yeah I, I i i did see that and yeah. uh apparently, I had to, every, I, apparently I had, every american needs to have a nuke is what i said it's, it's amazing i don't remember saying that but yeah well, well, well you know <laughs> as, as and i i said this when i was growing up living on the air base still a few of my friends that what we need is a good dictatorship there is no good dictatorships right Correct. <laughs> so that in itself is Oxymoron. contradictory to the whole thing. Yep. Just like saying that, well, our government has nukes, so as individuals, we should have nukes. Well, I will say, you know, <laughs> the day after that article it was hilarious because Joe Biden was on the TV, President Biden, and he made the statement that, well, the people in America can't stand up to us because, well, you have guns, but we have F-15s and nukes. I mean, that right there is inflammatory and makes people say, well, then you're right. I need a nuke and an F-15. I, yeah. I, again, I'm not, I, look, in my, in my opinion, nobody, no living being that we know of or can envision. Okay. Just froze up. There I am. I see you moving now. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. My connection Just, is unstable. Oh, no. Oh, oh. I've had that. <laughs> there we go. I'm good now. But yeah, I, again, nobody nobody needs to have some of these things. And for our president to stand up there and basically poke at people and say, hey, you can't stand up to me because you don't have them, makes them want them even more. and makes them believe that oh, yeah. the right and, 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 is there to have it. And it makes those on the extreme right right and even on the extreme left go ape shit yes because either way yeah the, the argument's there they're saying the same things just saying it backwards it's yeah in a perfect mm -hmm. world nobody would need a weapon if we oh, lived yeah. in this, this beautiful utopia where nobody needed weapons and everybody had everything and we were all equal that'd be great but unfortunately again everything made by man is failable and well here we are right i want right. what you have so i'm going to take it and that's just the way the world e works e e right even if it even if it means that I have to kill you for it. It's human nature. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but I mean, it's literally the way we've done everything. Everybody wants to talk about, you know, we're illegal aliens here because we took the land from Native Americans. Well, where, who did the Native Americans take the land from? You know, it, you, again, it, it, it's a never ending thing. And it's, it's unfortunately the way the world has always worked. Yeah. And it's always comes down to a blame game. But, um, yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, let's see here. LGBTQ and civil rights. Okay. Um, I know I read, and this is something that I know that those within the LGBTQ community would take offense to um, your wording of saying that it's a choice. Yep. I'm, I'm already well aware of this. And I'm, I've been trying yeah. my damnedest to find a way to word some of that so that it's not so, not even forceful. It's, it's abrasive. Is yeah. what, it is. what I'm trying to say there, and I'll say it this right here is, look, if you want to be whatever you want to be, that's fine. We have that right. What I have a problem with is where we, the genderfication piece, mainly more than anything. I don't care what you do to your body, but you can't change your, your, your body's genetic makeup. No, you are either that, born male, female, or what are they? Uh, used to be hermaphrodite. I, they change intersex. Those yeah. are it. Biologically, that's it. So when somebody says that they're not one of those, it's like, well, genetically you are. You might identify as something else, or you right. might have a sexual preference for something else, but those are not your gender. Your gender is your gender. And, well, and it, it, that's it, one of my bigger arguments. I don't, yeah. like I said, my, my campaign manager, he, he belongs to the LGBT, LGBTQ community. And we've had this discussion and we've been trying our damnedest to reword that so that it doesn't come across as so abrasive because choice is a very sticky word. And yeah, I don't- it, 
I'm trying to figure out, yeah. I'm actually working with the LGBT uh, Association of New York, trying to piece together a little bit better way to word that where it becomes a, not so abrasive and still gets the same point across. Because again, I'm not a member of that community and I can't put myself in that situation. So all I can do from the outside looking in is say what I believe and then try and have people who are part of that community help me make that less abrasive and more acceptable. And mm -hmm. that's what I'm working on right now. Because like I said, I understand the word choice is very diversive. And I don't think choice is the right word. And until I can figure out a word to put there, that's the only word I can use. Yeah. Yeah. Even me being part of the LGBTQ community, even I find some of the wording to be messed up. And I'm looking, and again, I, again, that's one of the topics I'm very stringently looking at and trying to get input from people who aren't straight white males, mm -hmm. me, uh, you know, for some input on that, because again, I know the word choice, you know, again, my campaign manager, he, he, he'll say straight up, he's like, do you think I made the choice to be gay? I'm like, no, I, again, choice is, it's a hard word to use. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it comes back to the same argument they've been having for decades about, well, show me genetically that you're gay and they can't mm -hmm. because this quote unquote gay gene that everybody keeps trying to prove doesn't ex uh, exist we can go into the, the talk about hormones uh, estrogen uh, again the whole nine yards yes, yes. and it's, it's it's very again it's a very sticky subject but the problem is everybody shies away from it and rather than everybody get angry at each other maybe just having an educated debate and conversation is really what we need just like open the door and say hey let's talk about this and if what i say offends you please understand i'm not trying to offend you i'm trying to understand we're trying to make something that helps everyone mm -hmm. and that's what we need to do instead of the biggest problem we have in this country right now is if something's offensive to somebody, the best thing we can do is we're not going to talk about that because it might offend somebody. Mm -hmm. We need to. We need to be open about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, because um, when um, there was um, a couple um, bills that were passed in New York State over the past, over the past 10 years, I believe. Um, one of them was Sonda, which was for um, gay and lesbian rights. Right. And a few years back, there was Gender, Gender Equality Non-Discrimination Act, mm -hmm. which was passed and signed into law by Governor Cuomo that um, addresses some of the inequalities that the LGBTQ community has faced within Congress itself. There is the Equality Act. The Senate has their version. The House has their version. Right. Um, as far as I know, neither one has actually passed and been and obviously not signed into law. But um, one of the meetings that um, me and the executive director of our organization had with um, Congresswoman Stefanik's people here in Plattsburgh was about that piece of legislation. Yes. Very simple piece of legislation. All it does is it changes the wording within the Civil Rights Act from the 1960s. Mm -hmm. When we met Congresswoman Stefanik was all for it. She voted for it. It was either, I think it was 2019 or last year when it came back up for a vote, she voted against it. I looked at that piece of legislation again and it's like- What changed? The legislation obviously didn't change. What changed? Think about what happened last year at that time. Mm -hmm. What was she? What was she doing at that point in time? And again, I'm not trying to sling mud. I'm, this but, is where I get back to the to Elise Stefanik has turned into a party politician. Right. She no longer represents North Country, and that's why we need people like me or whoever else wants to stand up and do it to physically represent the people of North Country, because mm -hmm. again, the party wants one thing. Does what the party want benefit 
and help North Country? If the answer is no, then she's voting the wrong way. Right. And um, being the number three person in the GOP now definitely makes her a party politician. Obviously, she's going to vote for what is best for the party. Now, the problem becomes when what happens when something's better for the party than it is for the people of, New, of uh, upstate New York? Or, or the country itself. Well, correct, that too. But I'm, no. again, her, her job, or my job if I can get it, would be to represent the 750-ish thousand people that live in North Country first, foremost, mm -hmm. no matter what. Oh, yeah. And then after that would be the state of New York and then the U.S. government, veterans, everything else. But first and foremost is the people that live within the limits of this district. That's mm -hmm. the priority. And that's what, not just her, there's a lot of them that mm -hmm. they don't vote based on what is best for their, their constituents because – they vote for us and we vote for them. There's no us. That's why you'll notice that I very seldom will call myself they or I. I am trying to do this so that we have somebody, we, that represents us because that's what we don't have. That's what many, many congressional districts are missing is somebody who represents them, the whole. And mm -hmm. Congress people, senators, elected officials in general have forgotten the fact that they are part of that constituency. They mm -hmm. are part of the them. When I say I'm doing this for you, no, you're not. You're doing this for us because you're us. And they, they don't see that because, again, there's that elitist thing where they're above us. Mm -hmm. And recent polling shows that a lot of the um, legislation that's been put out that still has to be voted on um, is wildly popular. It has majority support from both Republicans, Democrats, independents, liberals. Um, the, what is it, the infrastructure bill that's going to be coming up for a vote here soon. Yes. Is widely popular with everybody. Yet, you have one party that doesn't really want that. One part or, or, they, or they want to have a very slim down version that doesn't cover everything that's needed. Now, I will say this about legislation, and this is one of the things I do talk about in there regarding uh, line item veto and everything else. I believe that we need to ensure that legislative bills that come up are associated with each other. The we'll just use the infrastructure bill should not be tied to human rights bills. If it doesn't specifically go with that bill, it shouldn't even be part of it. And that's mm -hmm. where line item veto needs to come in. And again, it's, you know, it passed and got thrown out by the Supreme court because of presidential power, blah, blah, blah. I think that we need to look at that and maybe make it so that line item veto can be done by Congress and Senate and then reviewed Mm -hmm. And maybe not taking out of the president's hand or taking out of the president's hand at that point, because I, I understand what the Supreme Court tried to say in uh, Clinton versus state of New York, I think it was, or New York City state. It was, that's what it had something with Bill Clinton in the state of New York, but yeah. um, was the fact that it gave the president too much power to basically then change the laws or legislation that were given to him. So if you give the people creating the legislation that ability to line out and veto things out, before it gets to the president, the president either signs it or doesn't. That's it. He doesn't have the opportunity to, to take things out of it. That's where Congress and Senate come into place. That's their job is to yeah. write legislation, not the yeah. president. Yeah, I remember that it was during the uh, Clinton administration yep. that the uh, Supreme Court ruled that the line on veto was uh, non -con unconstitutional. Uh, Right, right. And it's on no my website. Doubt. Every time I talk about one of these things, when it comes to a court case, whether it's the gun control one, or it's linked so that people, if they want to question what I'm talking about, it's linked right there. And it says Clinton versus state of New York City, whatever it was. I can't remember off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. And they click on it. It goes right to the actual Supreme Court website, mm -hmm. not Wikipedia. <laughs> so Wikipedia is good. <laughs> no, it is. But people are more liable to or able to believe the truth if it comes from the source not a third party, which is what we're right. You're right. But um, lately, with the previous uh, legislation that's been uh, put forth, which was the For the People's Act. Yep. Um, 
Oh, you froze. There you go. That passed along party lines. Coffee? Sorry. Uh, yes. Um, it's the only way though, to pass. Yeah. Though there has been discussions, debates on whether the filibuster should be gotten rid of or, and I know this is within the Senate, it's not within the House because the House has no, nothing to do with that. But on your, just your opinion, should the filibuster be either revamped or gotten rid of? Because right now, it takes a super majority to pass anything. Correct. As opposed to just a simple majority. Right. Now, so the filibuster has its good points, especially where one party controls all three levels. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives people the ability to stop legislation which is just getting crammed down our throats. Now, I believe this is where line out of veto could come in and help filibuster help break up filibuster a little bit more is if I, I would like to think that the reason that the filibuster is going on doesn't have to do with party lines as much as it has to do with look we can agree with a chunk of this legislation but these things in here are the reason we're voting no and this is why we're holding it up i think if we can put line on a veto into place that will be something that'll help break up filibusters uh because there'll be less need for them because then now you get the, the opportunity to vote certain lines of that legislation out. Um, I, I, again, that is under the premise and the belief and hope that this doesn't just believe or go to, hey, I'm a Republican, I'm not voting on that because it's a Democratic bill and we're gonna hold it up because we can. And right now, that's how they're playing the game. It's the way vote, it definitely looks. And it doesn't matter which party it is. Well, they do it both ways and they've done it both ways for the last three to four presidents well before that too but it's happened a lot the last two decades right right but, um and amazingly look the exact same people are still sitting there hmm i have been one of those that have been all four term limits yep just and not just for members of Congress, but also when it comes to the Supreme Court. Judges in general. Mm -hmm. I, I, I will go as far as to say that I believe that there should be some sort of term or age limit mm -hmm. that at that point in time, whether you've served that many terms or you've hit that age threshold that, hey, look, good job, congratulations, you're out. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we did it to the president for a reason. You know, part of that was, you know, to not create basically an imperialistic empire because then they could stay there forever. But the other part of that is to get the new fresh views in. That's why Congress serves every two years and they get reelected or replaced. Uh, same thing, Congress is six years because they're supposed to have a longer, a broader view on things. Mm -hmm. You know, term limits need to be put in place for every pretty much elected position there is, in my opinion. And, whether and, again, whether it's hey, Congress, you can serve five terms, or hey, when you turn the age of 65 or 75 or whatever age they determine, you can no longer do this job. I don't mm -hmm. think I don't think that that's far fetched. And I think that that's part of the problem. Again, we have Nancy Pelosi's we have, you know, uh, oh, my God, um, McConnell, Mr. McConnell, those guys, they've been oh there God. for decades, decades, and, 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 Every, and, everyone says, hey, we need change. How do you change without changing the person the person's not going to change their opinion they're only going to change their opinion if it helps their wallet mm -hmm. oh, whoops i said that out loud i'm sorry i didn't mean to oh gee uh, <laughs> my bad don't, don't, yeah well don't worry i won't say anything wait a minute sure here. this is we'll this is being this is being just recorded. between you and me right yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's being recorded <laughs> speak you're being recorded did you know in the state of new york that it is perfectly legal for you to record a phone call between two people without that person's consent. Yes. Yeah. I, and then you can share it with a third party without that person's consent as well. Mm -hmm. Happened to me recently. Oh, gee. We won't mention any names, but I might be running against her. But oh, gee. That's okay. I didn't say anything stupid, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah, well. Um. 
I don't have a problem with me being recorded at all. What I have a problem with is, hey, if you're going to record me and then you're going to share it with somebody else without it being like a legal proceeding, I have a problem with that. Then it's like, hey, you know what? Can you at least give me the courtesy of, hey, I'm recording this call or, hey, you know what? I recorded our call and I'm going to share it with X, Y, Z. Fine. But just to blindly share something, thinking you're going to stick it to them and end up accidentally stepping on your own toes, I think it's pretty funny. Why not? Hey, karma. What do they say about it? It'll get you. Yeah, it's a bitch. <laughs> That would be but, it. Uh, but, um, like to end it here, okay. and um, we will continue this conversation at a later date. Yeah, please. And um, good luck on the campaign. You still have a little, little less than a year to go. Three hundred and forty-six days, I think it is. I lost track. I, the weekend threw me off. Yeah. But um, unfortunately, seeing that I'm a registered unaffiliated, I can't vote in either primary. Well, and if you look on my website regarding that, and I know we're trying to end this, that's actually something I put in there about maybe we need to change the way our voting system works. Why shouldn't you have a say in the primary of, you know, hey, I'm only going to be able to have these two, three, four choices for president, for Congress. Why do I have to limit it to just being Republicans, and Democrats, and I can only vote for those? Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's just my thought on it. But I will say this again. Hey, I'm a normal person. And I think that in order, or in order to bring some normalcy to DC, we have to put some people in there that are those average normal people, not elitists, not millionaires. I'm not going to have near the money that Elise Stefanik has to run against me. None. Oh, she, she, has a, she has a war chest, plus she has the backing of the DNC. RNC. RNC, whatever. But that's okay. Because, you know, the more and more I walk around North Country and talk to people individually, the party can support her all they want. They can't vote for. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. Well, um, you should make it out to Plattsburgh. I, it's on my list of things to do. Just Again, I have two days. I work 70 hours a week on the clock truck driving. So time is very limited. It's a three-hour drive over there. So I have to make it worth my while. And definitely, uh, I plan on doing that here very shortly. Yeah. And when you're here, look me up. And Definitely. we'll go and hang out at the uh, B-47 and the FD-111 that we have on display. I know, right where they're at. My daughter used to live right down the road from them. And I live on the former air base. There you go. I know right where you're at. Well, not exactly, but you know where it is. <laughs> yeah, I do. Maybe I'm triangulating your location right now. You know, I'm one of those oh, dirty, nasty Republicans that's trying to uh, track us all. <laughs> oh, gee. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't they put metal things in those uh, COVID vaccines? You mean that vaccine I haven't had and not getting? Huh. Oh, I've already been vaccinated. I was a guinea pig for 20 years and 11 days. Ain't nobody sticking me with anything that hasn't been proven. <laughs> Sorry. I can't tell you what shots I got, nor what side effects they may or may not ever have on me. But I'll wait a decade or so and see what the side effects listed on those TV ads that say when you may have gotten your COVID shot and you ever had these side effects, call Bernstein or whoever. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm one that believes in science, and oh, I I believe in science too. But the problem is, it took us decades to get a flu vaccination, but yet somehow in a matter of months we had a vaccine for the most dangerous thing that's ever supposedly hit this planet. That's what though, I have though the technology has been worked on for yeah. past couple of decades, I believe. Kind of funny to think about that we've been working on a vaccine for something that didn't exist. Huh. Conspiracy theory shit. Hey, you know, I, I like throwing that out there every now and then, you know. I just, <laughs> again, you know, how did we have a vaccine for something that was so dangerous and we had no precautionary availability to fix it? But now all of a sudden, boom, three months in, four months in, we have this vaccine. But again, it took years, years, years to get anything else approved through the FDA. Well, watch the contagion contagion is a great example of this i watched it last night again just because my wife hadn't seen it and uh it's funny eight years before covid hit they had a movie that almost paralleled this mm. Mm. <laughs> i was kind of hoping that you would uh mention the more recent um remake of planet of the apes <laughs> Well, hopefully the, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping we're not fighting an ape army right now. We don't know <laughs> so who knows? <laughs> uh, but then again, I'm a sci-fi geek. 
Yeah, it's all good. We have space, we have space force now. We're we're safe from ape ape, uh, ape aliens. You you, you want to know something? <laughs> Starfleet was around a lot longer. <laughs> exactly right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nanu Nanu. I, I still remember Morgan Mindy. He was my favorite. Yeah. Wait, that's live long and prosper. My bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah really. It's... Nanu Nanu. I can't remember. I, it's been so long. Morgan and Mindy was a favorite show too. It's terrible. Yeah. Oh well. Uh, okay. Um, we'll be talking later, Lonnie. You have a fun-filled sure. Sunday. And um, whenever you're driving, if you see a squirrel, just stick your head out and say, squirrel! <laughs> I already do it every time. I try not to hit them, but again, 80,000 pounds, I'm not swerving. <laughs> okay, you take care. Thank you very much. Yeah, And have a nice day. You too, sir. Yep, bye.